talk first about why do we need enlightenment. The most important thing is most African countries, except Mauritius, are considered to be what you call failed states or failing states. And what we call failed states are states that cannot provide essential human development and human security services to their population. When we talk about human development, we talk about education, we talk about health, and we talk about a much more fulfilling, longer life for the population. When we talk about human security, a life free of menace, freedom from fear and freedom from want. And we talk, when we say freedom from fear and freedom from want, we're talking about issues like gender-based violence, violence against women, rape, harassment, domestic violence, violence against children, and of course, generally, the lack of security in any given situation. And this is very important because from my experience around African countries, I've worked in DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. I've worked in Sudan. I've worked in Somalia. I've worked in 26 African countries which have crises of different states. And here you see the plight of human beings which no, nobody would actually imagine. What you read in the papers is just the tip of the iceberg. When you hear genocide in Rwanda, we were the first group of people to go in into Rwanda after the genocide. 800,000 to 1 million people died, and the corpses were still on the streets. But when we went out of the airport, there was a big banner saying, it's illegal to kill people. So much so people had lost their consciousness and their uh, humanity. So the problems we have are, of course, immense, and the solutions they need are equally uh, need to be strengthened. So. If we don't have, if a state doesn't fulfill what you call the material well-being of citizens, if there are international influence where states fight each other, if there are types of regimes that are not amenable to the participation of civil society, and of course, do we build a country or do we build a state? The country being the leaders and the population, the state being very often only the leaders. So. <coughs> The beginning of enlightenment is what we call purpose in life. Many writers, uh, Karl Marx, uh, uh, <coughs> Freud, everybody has written about purpose in life. The philosophical base of enlightenment is purpose in life. Do we have a purpose in life? If you don't have a purpose in life, if you don't have an objective in life, then there is n you don't know your destination. So when we talk about enlightenment, we need to talk about our destination. What do we want to be? And Africa is full of stories. The first university in the world was in Africa, Timbuktu. The first state that was form formed ever, the first government, is the Nubian state, which we have the Ethiopian uh, state today. And various research show to attest to this. So Africa is not without history, without its past. It has experience, it has history, it has philosophy. So the whole idea of rebuilding the renaissance of Africa, bringing enlightenment, is the ability of Africans to use this historical past and get out of the current problems we have. When we talk about democratic citizenship, I think this is the, f the base for enlightenment. Once you have purpose in life, then we talk about democratic citizenship. The French Revolution, the European revolutions, the American revolutions of the 17th and 18th centuries talked about liberty, equality, and fraternity. These were the basis for the transformation of society into making the state responsible, accountable, and of course support human development and human security. A state that was based on the will of the people, what we call democracy today. Of course, we have different, different variants of democracy. You have the laissez-faire laissez economy and democracy in the United States. We have the social and Christian Democrats in Europe. And we have the Asian economies which have developed their own form of participatory governance. But the, more, the most important thing that we need to see is, is the will of the people coming at the priority. So when we talk about advancing enlightenment, we talk about Western political domination has failed completely. 
in Africa, in many other places. The ability of colonial masters in Africa to translate and transcribe their own system into the African polity has failed because African cultures rejected them completely. That's why we have different forms of democracy. But the base for this has been the will of the people, which has been completely eroded through slavery, colonialism, and of course military dictatorships that came and went. We have documented more than 220 military coups and counter coups in Africa. And this has been the basis within which the current problems that we face in Africa should be grounded on. Uh, when we talk about the tools for enlightenment, you have a purpose in life, then education becomes the main tool for, for uh, enlightenment. And when I'm talking about education, I'm not talking about high school education or university education. It is the kind of cultural democracy within which community history, community experience, community, the richness of our cultures can be expressed. It is the ability to be able to critically think and define your purpose in life. And the problem that we have now in achieving the Millennium Development Goals is that we're talking about education and that is classroom education. And this is very difficult to understand to me because most cultures, advanced cultures, didn't have the kind of educational system that we had. We had kingdoms in Africa. Aksum was a vast kingdom in Africa. Dahomey in West Africa. The Songa in uh, the Southern African region. These were flourishing kingdoms which had art, music, culture, history, all combined, even written histories. And I think this is very important to go back again to countries like Iraq. At one point, President Bush was calling Saddam Hussein an uncultured man. And this guy, Saddam Hussein, comes from the cradle of civilization, Mesopotamia. So it's, 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 it's uh, an anachron anachronism when people talk about culture and a history of 7,000 years of education, culture, music, arts in the Mesopotamia Valley. And eventually what happens today is Iraq is in crisis, a million people dead. M many ton, thousand ton of tons of bombs were thrown there. And an entire culture has been completely destroyed. This is what has happened to Africa over a long period of slavery and colonialism. And that's why we need to bring enlightenment back. And people like Marx talk about the new vision of life erupting into history. Civil society should come up and change their situation themselves. If we are poor, we shouldn't wait for the state to make us unpoor. We have to do something ourselves. It is the organizational capacity within civil societies that would be an important impetus in changing this. And then, of course, the shifting concepts of scholarship talks about the ability of people to define their philosophy, to define their psychology, to define their anthropological makeup, and, of course, get a new being, a new society that has to be created. This is how the Jap Japanese recreated themselves. This is how the tiger economies recreated themselves. And this is how successful African economies now are recreating themselves. So, enlightenment needs rules and organizations. When we talk about rules, we're talking about state rules, like the constitution. We have legislated rules by parliament, and we have administrative rules that are made within government. But there are also other rules, community rules. You go to Borana, you go to the Somali region, I don't think many of these people know the rules that I mentioned earlier. They have their own rules. In Borana, they have the Gada system. It's a governance system that has evolved over thousands of years and still in practice. And since many of our laws have been imported from the French law or British law, African colonial masters, and laws should be made on the basis of people's aspirations, their vision, their goals in life. And these laws that have been copied from the French and English penal and civil codes are laws that have been developed using the aspirations of the Scottish Enlightenment, the French Renaissance, and what in common do we have with these populations and cultures? And that's why the laws that we have now taken from these countries are dysfunctional in pastoralist and agro-pastoralist areas in Ethiopia, in much of the uh, villages of Ethiopia. So we have to have what you call the learning organization. In fact, moving beyond, we talk about the developmental organization that can change itself, transform itself to different stress and shocks that, that would uh, 
be imposed on society. And this is a very good example because the resilience we've seen within the Ethiopian society and African societies is with all these wars, with all these famines and hunger, with all intrusions that we have from the international system, with the conflicts that you see everywhere, people still survive and thrive. Populations are increasing. And there is a resistance not to die, not to let go. And this is a very important issue when you come up with examples of, for example, Democratic Republic of Congo. This is a country full of mi minerals, diamonds, coltan that you have in every mobile phone that you have, transistors in the uh, computer. They have gold. They have flora and fauna that you wouldn't find anywhere. This is one of the most pristine environments that you would find if you sail on the River Zaire. But international forces have combined themselves to kill that nation. Any responsible state you would find in DRC would regulate its resources. So they create conflicts, they create guerrilla movements, they create um, small armies. You have child soldiers. Rape and violence against women is very common. Killing of younger women is, and men is very common. So that is the kind of enlightenment in Africa that should start with civil societies themselves in order to project an idea and a vision of society that's different from what we have today. And the kind of sages we had with the African societies, of course, every military coup, what they do is the first target is they kill the intellectuals. They kill the church leaders. They kill the mosque leaders. They kill the community leaders because they, couldn't f they, they wouldn't find acceptance. And this is how we are losing the kind of philosophical systems that we had in this continent, the customary systems, rules, I mentioned the Gada earlier, the Amhara have different forms of associations and rules, the Tigrayans the same, the Afar are the same, and in every African community they have rules long established before even states were formed in Europe and North America. And I think it's important to look into this, study them, and our historians should come up with very clear ideas of how these people survived and thrived within their societies uh, during this time. So the African Renaissance should have its own distinctive and shared elements. What do we share as Africans? What do we share as Ethiopians? Are we just a, a geographical entity? Or do we have any relationship between the cultures, language, psyche, vision? between, for example, the Tigrians and Amharas, the Amharas and the Oromos, and of course the Kenyans and the Ethiopians, the Sudanese and the Ethiopians. And I think what happens is society blends as you go from north to south, where languages blend, cultures blend, and they create their own unique character at every stage. But there are also similarities in history, in culture, in thinking that we need to glean from this. The concepts and rules of governance, we talk about democracy, but how many African countries have you seen that they had elections and there was no violence after the ele elections? We see Cote d'Ivoire today, we have two presidents in one country. And I think this message is that elections need rules and institutions that need to be respected. Rules and institutions that guarantee peaceful, uh, peaceful co political competition and participation. So we're trying to build democracy in Iraq while the American government is bombing that country. You have elections going on on the ground, and I, I'll leave the judgment to you because I'm not judging this, but democracy requires a fundamental set of rules and institutions if it's going to function. So in conclusion, what I would like to say is, what I want to share with you is, we have a past history. Of course, we don't learn from the bad part of our history, but we learn from the good part of our history. Whatever kind of governance forms we had, whatever kind of village democracies we had in this country, in this continent, we need to glean the best practices, the good practices, and try to develop instances in which we can say, okay, these are practices that we need to replicate. Otherwise, the intellectual debate that we have in Africa today concerning democracy and governance is, if I don't rule the country, then nobody rules it. Thank you.